Good morning, welcome to In the Trenches with PAC. Today's topic is going to be atrial fibrillation. I am going to give a very short chalk talk on this common medical problem. Right, this is one of the most common arrhythmias we see in both uh, the inpatient and outpatient venue. So basically, with atrial fibrillation, there are three, there are three main issues. There's rate control, there's rhythm, converting to normal sinus rhythm, and there's anticoagulation. These are the three major goals. So let's talk briefly about the causes of atrial fibrillation. You know, what, what causes it? This is a common, this is a common medical problem. Um, usually we don't have a definite cause, but the things we like to think of, obesity is a strong association with it, as does hypertension. Um, in the olden days, rheumatic heart disease, especially mitral stenosis, was one of the most common causes. The other thing that you have to think of, and everybody with no one said AFib needs to be evaluated for this, is hyperthyroidism. Pericarditis could cause this, and myocarditis. Once in a while, we see this with pulmonary embolism. We used to see this a lot post-cabbage. Something else to think about is alcohol toxicity, binge drinking. Um, the term for this is holiday heart. You could see this with other toxins like amphetamines or cocaine. Um, CHF and any type of underlying structural heart disease is clearly, clearly associated with this. Um, you can see this with sick sinus syndrome in the elderly. WPW, Wolf Parkinson White, has, has an association with atrial fibrillation. It goes down the accessory pathway and it could convert to ventricular tachycardia. And CADMI, of course, is associated with it, but AFib's not a real common cause post-MI. Post um, the, other, the other thing is it could be idiopathic, and you might not have the cause. And there's something we, call, we used to call it lone atrial fibrillation. Okay, with lone, with lone atrial fibrillation, it was age under 60 and no underlying heart disease. This, this term they've gotten away from with using these new risks, risk assessment scores, such as CHADS A2, P2, FAST score. Um, all right, so these, these are the causes. I remember as a resident learning this mnemonic, I'm not sure how helpful it is now, MAP RAT. MI or myocarditis, aminophilin toxicity, um, pericarditis, pulmonary embolism, rheumatic, A was thyroid toxicosis, and the other A was alcohol. Um, it's just something to think about if you get pinned from somebody wants you to go through the causes. Okay, somebody presents an atrial fibrillation, the first thing you need to do is assess their hemodynamics. So if somebody has atrial fibrillation and their blood pressure is low, you need to deal with it immediately. And you have your series of challenges with that. Assuming their blood pressure is adequate, the next thing you need to do is slow the rate. So you're talking about Blood, giving medications that decrease connect blood and uh, decrease conductivity through the AV node. Okay, three groups of drugs: beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, non-dihydropyridines. This would be verapamil and diltiazem, and to a lesser extent, digoxin. Back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, ditch was the first drug used. It's okay for AFib at rest. Once somebody starts walking around, you have sympathetic overdrive. So these are really the medications that are used to control atrial fibrillation. Now, the next issue is rhythm control. Does everybody need to be put in sinus rhythm? No. Um, often they give people trials of normal sinus rhythm. Um, initially, they'll treat it medically, and then they could get cardioverted. And you know, if that doesn't work, they may need uh, more advanced EP procedures. You know, if somebody cannot tolerate AFib, they might 
do better in sinus rhythm. The other, the other situation, a lot of people feel better, feel better in normal sinus rhythm. And the, then the third issue was the risk of stroke. So one of the big things with atrial fibrillation is these people are at a high risk for cardiovascular stroke. And often the strokes that you get with atrial fibrillation are devastating, devastating type strokes. Um, and, you know, the, the data really started coming out in the very late 80s, early 90s, where people should be anticoagulated. And initially, they were anticoagulated with warfarin. It really wasn't well into the millennium that they started using DOAS to anticoagulate. The thing is, the, the, the feeling is that somebody would to be anticoagulated for about three weeks before before they're converted to sinus rhythm. Now, if they can't be, for whatever reason, you're gonna need to do a TEE, and if there's no clot there, you can cardiovert them. Um, you're not gonna visualize the clot, usually, with the transthoracic echo. The thrombus sits on the left atrial appendage. Um, then what they did, with they, they, they would anticoagulate them for three weeks, and then an additional four weeks, because of a phenomenon called atrial stunning, where the EKG looked like the atrium was in normal sinus rhythm, um, but the heart was still fibrillating and they would anticoagulate them for another four weeks. That has evolved. These patients, even if they're cardioverted, they're anticoagulated, unless there's a contraindication for anticoagulation. Um, they're, any, they're anticoagulated um, because they could have intermittent AFib and they could still have a stroke. So that's not a reason. Normally these people, once you have AFib, even if you're in, in normal sinus rhythm, you're anticoagulated. The initial studies used warfarin. There are four DOAX, Dabigatran, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, and a doxaban, any of these medicines could be used to treat normal sinus, uh, atrial fib for uh, stroke prophylaxis, um, and, and they all work. The one bugaboo is if somebody has a prosthetic heart valve, uh, they need, you know, a, a porcine valve uh, or, or metallic valve if they have a prosthetic heart valve, they need to be on warfarin. DOAX do not work as well, and this was, this was studied in, in the real-line trial. How do you assess who needs to be anticoagulated? There were different rules, but here, here's basically the way it's been. It's called the CHADS A2, the S2, the S1. So this is CHF, anxious hypertension, systolic greater than 160, age, you get two points, age greater than 75, 1.65 to 74. D is diabetes, S is a prior stroke, you get two points here. V is vascular disease, so underlying coronary disease or peripheral arterial disease, and S is sexual cohort. Uh, which is women have a higher incidence than men. This is being thrown out of this. But the feeling is if your score is zero, you probably don't need any coagulation. And if it's two or greater, then you do need any coagulation. If it's one, you're kind of left, you're kind of left in limbo and that's and that's dealer choice. So the majority of these patients are gonna be any coagulated one way or the other. Um, so the, the, major, the major issues with atrial fibrillation are number one, slowing the heart rate. Number two, determining if you're gonna attempt cardioversion to normal sinus rhythm. The most common drug now used is amiodarone. Um, but there are other medicines. They used to use the 1A antiarrhythmics like quinidine and plocanamide. They're not used anymore because of prolongation of the QT intervals. Um, and then the third issue is anticoagulation and what agent. And if you're gonna cardiovert them, you wanna make sure they're protected with anticoagulation. With that, I'm gonna stop. We are in the trenches with David Cohen talking about atrial fibrillation. Thank you.